and cricket is top of the sports max zone for today. Former world champions West Indies have sunk to another low as they suffered their first one-day international series defeat against Ireland after they went down by two wickets in the decider on Sunday at Savina Park in Kingston, Jamaica to lose the series 2-1. Batting first, West Indies for the third successive game failed to battle their overs as they were dismissed for a paltry 212 in 44.4 overs. Shea Hope at the top of the order, top scored with 53 against Andy McBride, 4 for 28. Ireland in reply stumbled their way to the target, posting 214 for 8 with 31 balls to spare. Andy McBride was again the star performer. Top scoring with 59. Will scores in the match West Indies 212 all out. Ireland 214 for 8. Speaking after the match, West Indies skipper Karen Pollard bemoaned his team's poor batting. This is what he said. It's a sad day for us and a sad day for West Indies cricket. Very disappointing and a tough pill to swallow. We have a batting problem in the Caribbean the last couple of years. And from a bowling perspective, guys can only defend what we have on the board and they worked their backsides off to get the wickets. Meanwhile, Arilon with a 2-1 series triumph can now boast of its maiden bilateral ODI series win against a chess-playing nation other than Zimbabwe and Afghanistan. Ireland also climbed to third in the World Cup Super League, which is a direct qualifier for the 2023 World Cup in India. Well, international cricket commentator Fazir Mohammed has been following the series and he joins us now. Welcome, Faz. Good to be on the show once again, Mariah. Happy to have you. Can you give us your overall assessment of the Windies versus the Irish? I think Aaron Pollard encapsulated it. Uh, I would just extend it to say that I think this batting problem has been going on for more than two years. Uh, maybe it looks worse now, the fact that we've actually lost a bilateral series with Ireland, given the fact that three years ago, ahead of the 2019 World Cup, we breezed past Ireland in three one internationals in Ireland ahead of the World Cup itself. And we all recall how disappointing the West Indies were actual World Cup. So even then, in the midst of that poor performance, so we were confident that we had the measure of Ireland. But now you have a situation where, yes, granted, and again, we need to point this out, the West Indies batted first uh, on three occasions at Savannah Park, where the conditions obviously were more favourable to the bowling. But as the captain himself would have pointed out, that's no excuse. You're talking about players who would have had quite a bit of experience. Yes, there are a couple of newcomers along the way. But if you look at the overall balance of experience in the West City squad, it, it's very difficult to fathom or accept that this is where West City's batting is now at, especially when we're talking about the limited over format of the game. Yeah, Faz, and you know, many a times when we discuss the batting failures, we like to start by talking about how the top order had failed and, you know, obviously the rest came in and that was history. In this particular third ODI, we had Shea Hope, who was able to get 53 of 39 balls and I have to say, a good start. So, you know, what accounted for the rest of the batsmen not capitalizing on the start that they got from the opener in this particular match? We've simply just been poor, Mariah. And, and even with, with that 53, and, and we saw it in uh, the, the first match uh, when uh, Shamal Brooks uh, got 93. Uh, and we, we see these good innings, these encouraging innings. But uh, that apart, there are only bits and pieces after that. And then you end up being, what, 140 on for seven. And then scrabbling to get 213, as happened yesterday. The match before, you were 150 on for eight. Then eventually, we were going to get a few more runs on the board, courtesy of the big, big hitting of Odin Smith and Romario Shepard. That's not good enough. That is not good enough at the highest level of the game, especially when you're talking about a team with a history and a pedigree. It's, it's one thing to say the Irish, given all the challenges that they would have faced because they're a relatively new test playing nation, but are not regarded as such because they're given very little as far as test matches to play. Yet for all of those limitations, they don't have a really vibrant first class system in their own country, which continues to hamper them. That's why a lot of their top players play their cricket uh, across in England and in other parts of, of the world to really get themselves ready for the highest level of the game. If you look at someone like Kekta, 22 years of age, 
five half centuries and seven innings and batting in the way that you would like to see players in the West Indies appreciate the fact that okay, not everything is crash, bang, wallop. Not everything is 6-4, dot ball, dot ball, dot ball. But it's an opportunity to build an innings when you have a gettable total and show that sort of discipline. So it, it, it's really difficult to fathom what really is continuing to result in acceptance of mediocrity. Yeah, and Faz, just to touch on the bowling before I hand over to Lance, you spoke about this level of cricket, which means we're at the highest level of cricket. Jason Holder, somebody that you would consider, you know, one of the more senior players, um, somebody who can do damage with both bat and ball, he only bowled two overs in this particular ODI. Any information, you know, any reasoning that you could give to us as to why this was so? And if not, um, maybe, you know, what was the reasoning behind such a decision? Well, I, I don't know if the question was asked of the captain, Karen Pollard, because I'm not there on location at Sabina Park. But yeah. uh, clearly, it's, it's, it's something that, that a question would have to be asked. They said that he's, he's carrying an injury. Uh, is, is, he, is he tired? But um, really, we have to remember that uh, he played in the series in Sri Lanka, uh, but then opted out of the matches that were played in Pakistan that are bought at all. Uh, so he should be relatively fresh. But, but again, in the absence of really understanding what would have happened, is it tactical? Is it something that Karen Pollard just wanted to give other bowlers an opportunity? And, and again, the bowlers almost pulled it off. I mean, Ireland did their best to throw it away. From 190 for four to having to scramble for victory with only two wickets in hand. Really, as much as we want to give credit to the West Indies bowlers for their disciplines and plugging away, uh, the Irish tried their best to lose. And from their point of view, they were finally able to pull it off. But there, there are a lot of issues to be raised when we talk about West Indies cricket at all levels and all formats. Yeah, Faz, uh, the captain has already put the batting under the microscope. But how, how does the West Indies explain being unable to bat out 50 overs in three one-day international matches against Ireland, who are you know, nowhere near you know, a top-flight team? That, that, that is unbelievable, isn't it? Lance, we are no longer a top-flight team. Forget about no, that. I'm, I'm talking about Ireland. I'm not, I know the West Indies no, aren't a yeah, top-flight team. Know, but, but I know you're saying it in the context <laughs> of to be struggling so badly against Ireland, who are not a top-flight team, which assumes that we are at least better or consistent. Yes. Our batting suggests that we are not a top-flight team. That, 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 that we have sunk to a level of mediocrity. And this is the concern. If you, you look at the last six months, lads, we've had the disappointment of the World T20 campaign, which was abysmal. We've had the disappointment of the Test Series in Sri Lanka, where, again, you saw the West Indies, even with little bits and pieces there, and even with some rain in the first Test match, was soundly beaten in both those Test matches. Then you had the three T20s in Pakistan, and the West Indies, again, even though in the last match they did well, they did over 200, were again beat. Then we come to these three one-day internationals, and you see again, the West Indies facing, yes, some challenging conditions, and credit to the, to the Irish bowlers. These seeming conditions are would be right up, up, up their alleyway. Uh, the, the heat and the humidity were not, but they bowled well. They, they were disciplined. They're spinners as well. Balberni with ball and bat, that's why he was mad at the series. But for whatever reason, and this is not just about at the top, whether we're talking about a regional game, whether we're talking about a club game in our respective territories, whether we're talking about a schools game. And this is something that many a former great West Indian, I know Jeffrey Dujon in his role 20 years ago as a coaching advisor in the West Indies cricket setup before he became assistant coach to Roger Harper, lamented the state of our school system when it comes to cricket. And I don't think we've properly addressed that. So I know, Lance, that is not the magic bullet that people want to hear. They want to hear, drop this one, drop that one, pick this one, pick that one, and it's going to solve everything or most things. The evidence of the last 26 years would have shown us that it will take a lot more than that, a lot more patience and some really concerted effort, which at this point we haven't really shown. Yeah, you're going into a direction that I'm going to take the discussion now fast because what you've pretty much outlined is that the problems in West Indies cricket at the moment are multidimensional. It's not, it's not just, just one issue. And I know people say that, you know, when a team fails, no matter what the sport is, 
um, the coach has to has to take responsibility and, and, and coaching changes need to be made. I'm you know, always saying that it doesn't matter if you change a coach, the captain, the selectors, cricket board, West Indies cricket is in dire straits at the moment. Having said that, though, the, the coaching staff at the moment is, is wallowing with this current team, no matter what the, what the format is. Would you say Phil Simmons' place as coach is in, in danger or, or his position should be reviewed? Definitely reviewed. Whether it's in danger or not is another matter. The point is that it cannot be a series of results like this. And you say, well, okay, this contract has been renewed. We, we, we're not even thinking in that direction until, until that time comes. It can't be. Because this is a performance-based environment. This is a competitive environment. This is an elite sporting environment. And, and again, this is where performance matters. You could talk from now till kingdom come about this encouraging sign or that encouraging sign. At the end of the day, you are expected to perform or at the very least see continuous improvement. We are not seeing that, certainly in the batting department in, the, in, in West Indies cricket at all levels, as I've said before. So again, and, and, and it is really up now to the authorities to really sit down with Phil Simmons and everyone associated uh, with him, the, the batting coach, uh, Mon, uh, you know, that Monty Desai. Uh, people have said, well, you know, why Monty Desai shouldn't it be this batting legend, shouldn't it be that batting legend? It does not automatically work that way. But that doesn't mean that we, there shouldn't be questions asked. There should be some really frank and maybe harsh assessments if unnecessary. And if it means that Simon and others have to be relieved of their positions, so be it. But again, we can't assume that just because you get rid of Simmons and you're, or you bring in the first legend that walks through the door, automatically means it's going to solve the problem. But it, uh, that's why you're right, Lan. It is multidimensional. It's not like the NFL, for example, where they fire you at the drop of a hat because they know they've given you all the resources. They've bought the best players and in the, in, 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 they've traded for the best players. The draft, they've picked up the best players. They've gotten the best players that money can buy mm -hmm. in the NFL or the English Premier League. That's why they sacked the coach at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. In the environment, it's different. We have many different challenges. But you must assess the performance and that starts with the coach. Yeah, and in 15 seconds, Faz, the West Indies have another white ball uh, fixture uh, coming up starting this weekend against the English in, in Barbados, T20 version now. Um, what, what can we expect? Uh, I know England's cricket at the moment is a little demoralized from the Ashes uh, debacle, but it will pretty much be different players here in, in T20 cricket. Um, can the West Indies expect to do anything well against the Englishmen starting this weekend? Because it's the T20 format and it's far more unpredictable, uh, you could say it could be a, a, an even series. Uh, but, but again, whatever the English do, whatever the, the, the damage from the Ashes series, remember it's a different squad from the one that would have been involved in the Ashes. They will have their own aspirations as well. They may be hungrier than the West Indies players. Uh, at, at this point, uh, I, I'm, I'm tempted to give the, the West Indies the edge, but at, at this stage, I wouldn't rule out England taking the series. Definitely. Well, Faz, thank you so much. Keep up the good work at the Under-19 World Cup, and we'll be looking forward to having you on the show again very soon. Thank you. Oh, of course, we just spoke to uh, Fazir Mohammed, our international cricket commentator. We're heading to a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.